Please welcome Christian Lum, PhD, lead statistician for the Human Rights Data Analysis Group for What's an Algorithm Got to Do With It? Thank you. <laughs> I guess we're running a little ahead of schedule, so I'll just go ahead and get started. So I'm going to be switching gears a little bit and talking about things that I think are a little bit different than what the other speakers so far have been talking about. I'm going to be talking more about data, security, and surveillance, not in the digital world, but in the real physical world. Um, I'm going to be talking about predictive policing. Um, and what I hope to impart upon all of you by the end of the day or the end of the next 13 minutes is that if you use biased data um, to train your machine learning algorithm, that the model that you learn will, will reproduce and reinforce the biases in the data. And I'm hoping to give you an example of that. There's All right, great. And so I think I may have just used a couple of words that tend to get people a little bit nervous. Um, the first of those is bias or biased data. And, I, and so I want to be really clear when I'm talking about biased data, but I'm just talking about sort of a statistical concept. I'm talking about a data set where some things you're trying to measure are more likely to appear in the data set than other things you're trying to measure. Um, if we're talking about crime data, that's simply saying that some crimes that occur are more likely to be recorded in the particular data set that you have than other crimes. Um, and I want to be clear, this isn't necessarily a value judgment about the data set or anyone who compiled it. Um, you can compile very useful data that's non-representative or where things are, some things are harder to collect than others. The word bias, I think, does raise hackles in some cases. And so I just want to be clear that that's what I'm talking about when I say bias data. Um, the other word that I think I said that gets people a little nervous sometimes is machine learning, algorithms, all those things. I know I'm in a relatively techie audience, so um, I won't baby you guys too much. But for anyone that that makes nervous, I, I just hope that you'll, you'll think ways to learn patterns and structure in data. And in particular, that the, the data that's fed into the machine learning algorithm. Um, which of the various, you know, many, many types of machine learning algorithms or models you pick will determine how you learn patterns in the data. It'll sort of give you a recipe to learn those patterns. And it'll tell you what kinds of patterns you can learn. Maybe you can learn a straight line. Maybe you can learn something like a decision tree. Maybe you can learn something that's so complicated I can't even describe it with something like a straight line. Um, but at the end of the day, all of, all of these machine learning models have the same goal of learning patterns in the data that are fed into them. Not something outside of it, just in the, in the data that you feed into them. And again, if you're feeding in biased data, it'll learn the bias patterns in the data. All right, so moving on. So what I want to talk to you about today is predictive policing. And this is essentially just applying machine learning to police records with the goal of making predictions about future crime. So how this will work is you'll take, say, police records of crime in a city. You'll apply machine learning to that. That will learn patterns in that data, in the police record data, right? And then that will allow you to make, based on those patterns that you've learned, you can make predictions about future crime. And then if you know, say, where a future crime will be or who will be committing that future crime, hopefully an intervention can be made. So for example, police can go to the locations that are predicted to have the highest level of crime and intervene, maybe stop crime from occurring before it happens, or you know, catch someone in the act and you know, get someone off the street, something like that. All right. And so if we want to talk about whether the data set's biased, we really need to think about, is, this, is the data representative, right? And when we're talking about police records of crime, I think there are many reasons to think that they're actually not necessarily representative of all crimes that happen in a city. So the first reason would be variation in reporting rates. And this one's really pretty simple. Some crimes are more likely than others to be reported to the police depending on who's victimized. You can look at the National Crime Victimization Survey. Um, it's a national survey, and they ask people, you know, were you a victim of a crime and did you report it? And in particular, you'll find there's variation in reporting rates across individuals. I think one of the patterns I've seen is that younger people are less likely to report on average than older people. Um, and in this case, I'm saying this is a source of bias in the data set, but this bias actually doesn't derive from the police it, themselves. It derives from the community, it derives from the people who are reporting to the police. Another, another source of bias in police data is variation in police attention. And in this case, I'm really just appealing to common sense here that you're more likely to find something where you're looking than where you're not looking. So if police pay a lot of attention over to this community and not so much over to this community, well, the crimes that occur over here are going to be more likely to appear in their data set than the crimes that occur over here where they're not looking. It's just sort of common sense. Another, another way to look at this would be variation in rates of enforcement for similar, similar criminal behavior. So even if you do observe someone um, committing a crime, if you don't actually end up recording it, say making an arrest or you know, having some sort of citation trail of this, that also won't end up in the data set. And so one little 
not so fun fact about that is that while white and black populations use marijuana at similar rates, blacks are arrested for marijuana possession at a rate that is several times that of white people. And so if you were to look at that data, you would then find that blacks would be overrepresented, overrepresented well relative to whites in that data set. So that would be another um, source of bias. And the last one that, at least to me as a statistician, is one of the most convincing arguments for why police records aren't a representative sample is that it's hard to collect a representative sample. I mean, this is something that statisticians, survey sampling people, spend a lot of time, you know, like the last century or so, thinking very carefully about how to do this. And it doesn't just happen by accident. You don't just happen upon a representative sample. It actually takes a lot of effort and planning to come up with that. And so, you know, legitimate police practice can result in a biased sample just because they're not tasked with collecting a random sample. It's just not how it works. And you're just not going to, you know, luck into that. And so the question then is, if we were to apply a, uh, a predictive policing algorithm to records, um, to records of drug crime, what would happen? That's what I'm going to show you here. So I took this um, data from Oakland, California. I got it from openoakland.org. They have a bunch of open source data. And this figure here just shows the sort of intensity of where drug crimes were observed in 2010 in Oakland. And so we see that the places that are the brightest red, they observe the most crimes. In the places that were, are lighter red, few, fewer in the gray places, they observe very, very few. And I think it's important to overlay this in light of what I was talking about with differences in rates of enforcement with a figure that shows the racial composition of Oakland. And so you can see here these dots. I don't know if you can see the, the label here, but each blue dot is one white person. A black dot's a black person. Uh, sorry, a blue is white, green is black, red is Asian, and orange is Hispanic, and brown is other. And so I've tried to sort of line up the two areas that had a lot of enforcement in the historical data. And so this circle corresponds over there. And we can see that's largely a black community. And right along here, where we see the, the pink area, that's a Hispanic community. And so again, that's sort of consistent with what we've seen before. Um, I didn't show you the data, but with studies that say that um, white people are less likely to be arrested for drug crimes. And so another way to look at this alternatively is also we can look at the percent using drugs. And so you can use, similar to what I showed you a second ago, um, substance abuse and mental health survey. This is another national survey where they ask people um, whether they're using drugs, but from the perspective of actually you know, getting better information for public health. And again, if we were to sort of reweight that survey based on the demographics of Oakland, we'd find that it's pretty likely that people are using drugs at roughly the same rates there, again, despite um, the sort of differences in enforcement. And so what I did was I actually re-implemented a, a real predictive policing algorithm, and I make one prediction for each day in 2011. So to make a prediction for January 1st, 2011, I use all the data from 2010. Then to make one for January 2nd, I use all the data. I use January 2nd of the previous year all the way up to January 1st of that year. Does that make sense? It's called a sliding window. You use data, move forward one day at a time. And the red squares are the locations that would be targeted if this algorithm had been implemented in this area. And so the patterns that we had in the data before, right, were that these areas right here and along here were overrepresented in the data. And actually, the predictive policing algorithm, the machine learning model did what it was supposed to do. It learned patterns in the data we gave it, right? It's just that those patterns were likely biased. And this ends up sort of reinforcing the bias in the past. I'll let you look at this for a second. The black dots are where the actual crime is. This is all real data, by the way. So how about we do a thought experiment now? What if when the police go to the red locations, they find a little bit more crime than they would have found anyway? I think that makes sense. Like I was talking about earlier, you're likely to find things where you're looking. So what would happen in that case? In the previous case, I just showed you, I stuck all the real data. I just used the data exactly as it occurred in 2010 and 2011 to make the predictions. In this case, I'm going to ask myself, what would happen if when they went to one of the red squares, they found just a little bit more than they would have found anyway? What would happen if they say, and I'm setting this parameter totally arbitrarily, what if they found 20% more than they would have found anyway just because that's where they're looking? Then what would happen? All right, so we have another movie here, and it's the same thing. Again, I'm using that sliding window to make a prediction, to make those deployments one day at a time for every day, so each red square is where they'd be sent. And it actually looks really pretty similar to what we saw before. If you were to do some sort of calculations on this, you'd find that the squares are moving actually a little bit less. But from a qualitative perspective, it actually looks very similar. It's still reproducing those same patterns as before. The difference, and it's a little bit hard to see in this figure, I think, 
can be seen if you're actually to look directly at the output of the model. So the gray line over here shows how much more likely um, the model is saying crimes are to appear in its predicted locations versus anywhere else. And, it, and in the original scenario where we stuck directly to the data, didn't have this sort of thought experiment where we add a little bit more, we find that over the course of the, over the, course of the year, it goes from, I don't know, maybe 20 to 25 times as likely in the, in the squares, right, where, where it's being sent. Then if we were to look at the black line, we start at the same place, okay, because it starts in the same place, right? But then as we add that little bit extra in those squares where, where the police are deployed, the algorithm becomes more and more certain that it's doing the right thing. So by, it, although at the beginning it thinks, okay, there's probably 25 times more crime in the red squares, by the end it thinks there's, I don't know, 65 times more crime? Again, this is a thought experiment. This didn't actually happen. This is just sort of trying to think through what would happen if we did allow, um, you know, biased data to drive future decisions. And so the punchline here is that machine learning will reproduce the bias in the data used to train it. I hope you all are sort of clear on this, but I think it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, or a little bit, I'd even go a little bit farther than that. So we need to think carefully about what's missing from the training, training data that we're using, especially when we're dealing with situations where there are real life consequences for the people. We're talking about, you know, physical security and all of those sorts of things when we're, when we're talking about deploying police. Um, and to use data and machine learning responsibly, we need to be aware of the consequences of reinforcing or amplifying the historical biases that, by the way, the software is marketed as and designed specifically to get rid of, right? The idea is that these machines, because they're machines and they're not human, won't be subject to the human bias of the past, the historical sort of systemic differences that, that we want to solve. This is sort of marketed and presented as ways to overcome those. And in fact, because the data is tainted by systemic bias in the past and we are learning the patterns in that data, we'll only reproduce and in some cases amplify those patterns if we are not very, very careful about how we think about data as not necessarily objective and um, not being naive about how we use machine learning to learn from those models. So thanks. That I'm maybe two minutes early. But <laughs>